Not long ago, I had a conversation with my spouse, whom I've been married to for 11 years. Unfortunately, it concluded with her in tears. This brought back memories of a similar incident three years ago when I was on the brink of losing my job. At that time, my wife Kate, also known as Catherine, was deeply distressed at the prospect of me missing our anniversary and insisted I return home. Fast forward to today, and now it's her who won't be present for our anniversary. I chose not to argue or persuade her otherwise. Nevertheless, despite this recent challenge, the past 12 years have been the happiest of my life. When I first met Kate, she was 24 years old and just starting her career in sales. She visited our architectural firm to convince us to advertise in fancy magazines, which at the time we couldn't afford. In the crowd, I couldn't help but notice an enchanting woman with black hair. After discussing the matter with my partner, he helped me grab her attention long enough to ask her out. After our first meeting, she confessed that she knew we couldn't pay for her services. Even with that knowledge, I fell deeply in love with her. Our relationship developed over six months, and eventually, she moved in with me for another six months as she transitioned from a nomadic lifestyle to a stable office job. Four months later, we tied the knot and became husband and wife. Every day, I still feel like the luckiest person alive for persuading her to marry me. With a sense of urgency, I dialed my boss's number once more. I've been with the company since the beginning when Craig first started the company. Our small team of designers, just four of us, achieved remarkable success by reducing production time in various fields. Craig, I know you're there, please answer, I pleaded into the phone. Finally, I heard his voice on the other end. Dan, I'm really busy right now, you know, he replied shortly. Deciding to keep it brief, I said, well, I'm leaving right now and won't be back until Monday. In response, he asked, leaving? Where are you going? I replied, I'm going to celebrate my anniversary with my wife. I'll be back on Monday. Have a good trip. Don't forget to knock before entering, he quipped. I chuckled and replied, you always manage to make me laugh, to which he responded, you know, I hear that a lot, not from those who really know you. Apologetically, I added, I'm sorry but ever since they brought this guy in to run Kate's department, there's been tension in our house. Maybe a break at the hotel will help defuse the situation, I assumed. Well, it certainly won't hurt. Just do me a favor, when you're seeking adventure, remember me, Craig grinned. Deal, see you on Monday, I said. I didn't hang up right away but asked Craig's secretary Rosa for a favor. She knew how to work things out, and I needed a plane ticket. After the conversation with her, I headed home to pack. While packing my suitcase, the phone suddenly rang. You have 45 minutes to get to the airport for security check. The ticket is waiting for you at the counter in your name, Rose informed me. She'd secured a return flight for me on Sunday afternoon at 1.30 p.m. Unfortunately, there were no available rooms at Kate's hotel, so she booked one two blocks away. Have a safe trip. See you on Monday, Rose said. Hearing that, I rushed to the bathroom to grab my shaving kit, packed it quickly and did a quick check of the room, even turning off the coffee maker, which was unusual for me, before hurrying to the car. Over 15 years I've discovered several shortcuts that help me reach my destination faster. Despite my high speed, I made it to the flight with plenty of time to spare. After registration, security, and boarding, we finally got on the plane. Once I was comfortably seated, I put on my headphones and played some music. I'm a nervous flyer, and music helps me relax and stay calm. Three hours into the flight, I was suddenly awakened from a pleasant dream about Kate and me by a gentle tap on my shoulder. I had fallen asleep, which wasn't surprising given my recent lack of sleep. Some of it was due to work stress. Kate and I had been going through a rough patch in our relationship for the past few months. For more than two months, she had been keeping her distance, not letting me get close. It all started when she told me about a colleague from another department getting a promotion and taking over her own. She was determined to prove that this decision was wrong and worked hard to show her worth. For the first two weeks, she came home exhausted, constantly discussing strategies to outshine Mr. Paul Reynolds. But over time, her determination waned, and after a couple of weeks, she mentioned that they had started cooperating. I became increasingly anxious as their joint mission to win a big client approached. Thoughts of a possible romantic relationship between them crossed my mind, but Kate always reassured me. Taking my bag out of the overhead compartment, I pondered how to invite Kate to dinner quietly without giving away the surprise. 
After taking a taxi to my hotel, I struck up a casual conversation with the driver, who happened to mention a charming, dimly lit restaurant located between our two hotels. It sounded intriguing, as it turned out to be exactly what I had in mind. After checking in, I quickly showered and rushed out. I wanted to catch Kate before she left for dinner. Glancing at the clock in the lobby, I saw that it was almost 5.30. After observing the bustling street, I decided I could walk to my destination and followed the directions given by the receptionist. The route was easy, and I made sure to remember the charming restaurant mentioned by the taxi driver, which happened to be just a few steps from our hotel. Furthermore, when I exited the taxi, I left the driver a generous tip. At 5.50, I entered the hotel lobby and stood in line at one of the reception desks. I exchanged a smile with a woman who motioned for me to come forward. Hello, I greeted her warmly. My name is Dan Cardiff. I'd like to know if my wife, Catherine Cardiff, is in her room right now. If so, I'd appreciate the chance to talk to her. Catherine Cardiff, you said, she double-checked, taking a moment to consult her notes. Yes, she's a guest here. Give me a minute to check if she's in her room. With that, she dialed the room number. After a while, she turned to me with an apologetic tone. I'm sorry, sir, but there was no answer. Would you like to leave a message? Not at the moment, I replied, a hint of disappointment in my voice. I was hoping to surprise her. We have an anniversary tomorrow. I'd be very grateful. If you didn't mention our conversation, I requested, hopefully no problem, sir. I assure you, she reassured me. I didn't catch everything she said. I wish you a wonderful day tomorrow, sir, the woman added politely. Thanks. I'm thinking about going to a restaurant. Maybe luck will be on my side, I responded. Good night, I bid her farewell. Heading to the far end of the lobby, I spotted a noisy hall packed with people engaged in various activities, working, serving, sitting, eating. It was very crowded, and I knew the chances of finding her there were slim. Then, I noticed a restroom located on one side, closer to the back wall. I searched all around, scanning left and right, desperately looking for any sign of her presence. Despite my efforts, she remained elusive. After finishing my business, I settled near the corridor entrance and once again scanned the room. It seemed futile, finding her in such a crowded place was nearly impossible. But then, I unexpectedly caught a faint sound of laughter reminiscent of hers. I followed the wall with my eyes but towering booths obstructed my view, allowing only glimpses of the faces of the men and the women with them. Reluctant to approach any table until I could escape her notice, I retraced my steps and turned my gaze toward the wall, slowly making my way along the row of tables, one by one. I reached the third one from the corridor where I was standing, and there, in that very booth, I saw her. She sat there, engrossed in conversation with a man I didn't recognize. She looked radiant, dressed in the same elegant dress she always wore on evenings filled with dancing. Their interactions seemed relaxed, as if they were entirely at ease in each other's company. I couldn't help but wonder what was really going on between them. It seemed far more close than a typical dinner with a colleague. My heart raced as he leaned closer to her, prompting me to instinctively grasp the doorframe for support. As she bent down, their lips met in a tender kiss filled with mixed emotions. I decided to leave the doorway and move to the center of the hall, sinking into one of the padded chairs with a high backrest. Time seemed to blur, I sat there, never taking my eyes off their table. Suddenly, I heard her laughter again, drawing my attention. Turning my head, I saw her walking beside him, holding his hand tightly with both of hers. Their closeness, along with the general mirth, piqued my curiosity. They strolled past me just fifteen feet away and even though they conversed, my focus was solely on the adoring expression she wore as she gazed at him. It had been a long time since I had seen such an enamored look. At that moment, my breath caught in my throat, and I was momentarily speechless. I headed for the exit, my expression likely betraying my displeasure. Fueled by a surge of determination, I walked straight to the sidewalk. I couldn't take my eyes off them. She clung to his arm, leaning affectionately against him. I watched as they walked down the street, eventually turning a corner and disappearing into a restaurant I had noticed earlier. As I snapped out of my trance, I hurriedly headed for the door, suddenly realizing my surroundings. I decided to slow down, giving them ample time to move away from the entrance. I came to a halt, taking a few deep breaths in an attempt to regain my composure. Undoubtedly, there was meaning in the expressions on their faces, 
but I desired more, even though I couldn't fully comprehend what it was. Summoning my resolve, I pushed open the door and cautiously entered, staying close to the wall since the entrance was unattended. I patiently stood there, waiting until my eyes adjusted to the surroundings, surveying the room. Finally, my gaze settled on them sitting at a table meant for two at the far end. I made my way there, clinging to the walls with my hands as I sat down at a small table. The waitress promptly appeared behind me. What can I get for you, dear? Waddle it be, she inquired. I replied, double scotch on the rocks. I overheard their conversation. Our meeting tomorrow isn't until ten o'clock, so we can celebrate late into the night, he said to Kate in a hushed tone. I'm glad you didn't let him manipulate you into going home. We wouldn't miss our two-month anniversary for anything, she exclaimed. I can't believe it's been two months, she added. And it could have been longer, he remarked, if only you had accepted my offer at the end of my first week at work, he reminisced. She laughed and added, I had to play the innocent girl with you, considering that I'm supposedly married, she shook her head in disbelief, recalling the moment when he approached her in the presence of Marge and asked her out, fully aware of his marital status. Marge actually told me that you liked me, he mentioned. We should do something nice for her because she played a significant role in bringing us together, Kate suggested. As the waitress approached to serve their drinks and swiftly walked away, they raised their glasses in a toast to the incredible two months they had spent together and the countless more to come. I'll do whatever it takes, he said as their glasses clinked together. There will be many more, she replied cheerfully. The waitress placed my glass in front of me and inquired, Here you go, dear. Is that all? I handed her a $10 bill and said, Thank you, ma'am, before shifting my attention back to the adjacent table. They glanced up, but as strangers, my presence seemed inconsequential to them. Kate, noticing his gaze, turned and looked at me. You know, a guy should always carry a camera with him for such moments, I remarked. Her expression was truly limitless, suitable for various posters, as she sat with her lips moving soundlessly. Wow, two months. This is a special anniversary. I still remember mine, but after eleven years, it begins to lose its novelty, I said, watching them both. I found myself saying, let's celebrate two months. It's a symbol of passion and prosperity, isn't it? Well, a lovely couple like you definitely deserves a gift, so here's my offer, I said, tossing the ring in Kate's direction. And here's a surprise, Paul interrupted Kate with a loud outburst. Realizing that staying here any longer would lead to trouble, I turned to Kate, who was trying to calm him down, and said, tell him how lucky he is that he wasn't in my home. Please contact me and let me know where you'd like to receive your belongings. If you're wise, you'll avoid coming to my house. Applying ice to your nose might reduce the discomfort, I stated, turned around, and departed, leaving the club. I walked briskly back to the hotel. It was unlikely that Kate knew my current address, and given my actions toward her friend, it seemed unlikely that she would pursue me. To create distance between us quickly, I rushed into the lobby, approaching the front desk. I politely asked, Excuse me, do you happen to have the contact numbers for airlines? I urgently need to book a plane ticket. The employee inquired, Certainly, sir. May I inquire about your preferred airline, as well as your desired departure time and destination? After providing all the necessary information, she assured me that she would inform me about the flight details in my room. Back in the room, I began to pace back and forth, bewildered by the unfolding events. How could this have happened? Then a thought struck me, perhaps Kate had missed her true calling in life. Her performance over the past. As my frustration continued to mount, I realized I couldn't stay in the room any longer. Grabbing my bag hastily, I descended the stairs to the lobby. When I reached the lobby, the receptionist, who had just finished a phone call, motioned for me to approach. Sir, if you leave now, you might make the last flight today. Registration closes in 30 minutes. If you miss it, the next flight is in three hours, she told me. I replied with a thanks, hoping the taxi drivers in the area were reliable. I signed the cash receipt handed to me by a woman. I'm sorry I have to cut my visit short. Please stay with us next time, she said, smiling warmly as I headed for the exit. A rush of unforgettable memories washed over me. Rushing out of the lobby, I quickly grabbed a taxi from the nearby parking lot. I asked, I bet you $50 you can get me to the airport in under 30 minutes. As I took my seat, the taxi driver responded, you got it, boss, snapping me back to reality. 
he turned out to be experienced and got me to my destination in just 20 minutes. I paid the meter fare, added a generous $150 tip, expressed my gratitude, and hurried to the exit. Reflecting on it later, I realized there was no need to worry. I had a few minutes to spare. After passing security, I eagerly awaited the announcement of the boarding. Unlike last time when I needed music to occupy my mind, with plenty of distractions around, a funny thought suddenly crossed my mind, and I had to suppress a laugh. I remembered that Kate's mother never really liked me. While Deborah seemed to have her husband under her thumb, she treated Greg poorly, almost like he didn't matter. But I couldn't tolerate her behavior, and she was aware of it. One day she even accused me of eventually cheating on Kate, claiming she saw me glancing at other women when we were together. Throughout the entire flight, doubts about what was happening gnawed at me. I pulled out the photo I always carried with me of Kate and me and studied it intently. The person next to Kate in the photo suddenly seemed unfamiliar. I glanced around to make sure no one noticed, then returned my gaze to the photo in the picture. I stood beside Kate, but what caught my attention was the way she gazed into his eyes. It made me doubt. Although men aren't typically known for their memory, I considered myself an exception. Like most women, Kate often tested my memory by asking, do you remember this, or do you remember that? Unfortunately for her, I remembered everything. I recalled every conversation, every plan, and all the close secrets we whispered in the dark. Sitting there now, I couldn't help but wonder if I hadn't noticed this unfolding for two months, what else had I missed? The man had shown interest in her from the first week they met, but she claimed she rejected his advances to maintain her appearance due to her marriage. The thought of them being together bothered me. I formulated a two-part plan, I'd go home, pack all her things, and take them to her mother's. Of course, the elderly woman would find a way to blame me, but the truth was what I saw. When we arrived at the airport, our family life was unraveling. I headed straight to my car and joined the exit queue. The drive home felt like a blur, and I couldn't remember much. Nevertheless, I reached my destination. The journey's duration remained a mystery, but honestly, it didn't matter. Stepping into the dimly lit house, I felt an eerie sense of unfamiliarity. The thought that I had to get used to the sight as the new norm consumed me. After dropping my bag, I headed for the kitchen. En route, I instinctively turned on the answering machine. A pleading voice on the other end said, Dan, please don't do anything rash. I'm heading home to talk. Please wait until I get there. She sounded pained, conveying her emotions. I believed the cheater deserved punishment, but I didn't want to hear it, especially not in that voice. So, I reacted impulsively and banged my fist. My actions may have been rash, but I needed to protect myself from foolish decisions. It was clear I wouldn't be able to sleep that night. I went to the garage and gathered all the suitcases she had collected over the years. Choosing a large black suitcase and a bag for her clothes, I set them aside and took the rest to the bedroom. As I sifted through her closet, I carefully picked a few items. I quickly stuffed them into one of the large bags, repeating the process several times before turning my attention to the dresser. It had been ages since I had seen underwear tucked in there. For a fleeting moment, the idea of grabbing some hot dogs crossed my mind. I was supposed to go to her mother's house, but I didn't want to, so I opted for a solitary gathering with locks and marshmallows. I didn't want to deal with her parents or anyone else, so I took matters into my own hands. Instead of waiting for her, I impulsively went to the hardware store to buy new locks. Upon returning home, I realized I couldn't leave the pile of stuff in the front room. Following my thoughts, I loaded everything into the car and headed to her mom's house. I drove carefully and unloaded everything near the garage, not wanting to burden Greg with extra work, especially since his wife and daughter wouldn't help him. As the third box fell to the ground, my mother-in-law appeared. Hi Dan, what's all this? What's going on? She asked. I explained, well, when Kate arrives, she might need her clothes. Initially, I thought she'd bring them herself, but I couldn't wait any longer. They were cluttering the front room. Confused and with a pale face, she inquired, what do you mean, when Kate arrives? I thought she wasn't in town yet. Why would her things be here, Deborah? I'm not entirely sure how she plans to sort things out, but I assume she might stay with you temporarily. She may be considering moving in with the person she's been spending time with, but I can't say for sure. That's why I brought her stuff, I explained, seeing her face grow paler. She responded, what are you implying? How can you accuse my daughter of such things? 
She had to stay there for work. She'd never cheat on you. Her voice trembled, nearing hysteria. I even saw them together last time. They looked happy. They were joyfully celebrating their two-month anniversary at a lively nightclub near their hotel. I repeatedly asked her to join me at home for our anniversary, and she regretfully said she couldn't. Determined, I hopped on a plane to be with her. However, when I arrived, I found them having an enclosed dinner. The atmosphere was romantic, and I didn't want to intrude on their special moment. Besides witnessing their tender kisses across the table, I needed some time to gather my thoughts. When they passed me in the hotel lobby, I contemplated saying something, but she gazed at him and whispered in his ear. At that moment, I couldn't bring myself to disrupt them either. I just needed some fresh air, so I stepped outside. To my surprise, they left and headed to the nearest nightclub. I sat at a table nearby and overheard her saying she didn't want to leave him on their two-month anniversary, and he corrected her, saying it was their third month. It dawned on me that if I wanted to leave, I'd have to intervene. I tried to stay inconspicuous, but I knew I had to find evidence. After ten years of sobriety, I took my first sip of drink. It had been ten years since Kate expressed concern about my drinking, which she believed could jeopardize our marriage. In response, I gave her my wedding ring, thinking it was a sensible gesture to give each of them something of their own. But honestly, I preferred his gift over mine. Now, as I awaited her return and the inevitable dramatic confrontation, I was sure she'd seek shelter at my doorstep for a while. I stated this to shock her. You're lying. How can you say such things about your wife, whom you've been with for eleven years? She's told me everything. She's deeply troubled by it. I'll never refer to this woman as my wife again. You might feel obligated to support her because she's your daughter. But I have no such obligations. I witnessed everything firsthand, and for the past two months, I've been living alone while she's been living with him since he joined this company. It's astonishing to see how she's changed, given the upbringing you provided. She looked me in the eye for three months straight, lying to me every day without a hint of remorse. If you think I'll allow her back into my home, then you're even more foolish than she is. However, it's your choice what to believe, and that's your issue. Personally, I've chosen to cut my losses. It's clear that she has strong feelings for this guy, and he's free to have her. She won't need to hide their relationship anymore. As soon as she's done with her charades, I'll direct her to this place. You can see for yourself who's being dishonest, as I instructed her, if she picks up, be sure to convey the message exactly as you want, including the fact that I'm eager to see how she handles this. With those words, I got into the car and drove away, feeling restless. I wandered aimlessly around the house for several hours before finding a small corner in the garage where I set up an improvised workspace. Suddenly, my thoughts were interrupted by the sound of the doorbell. Curiosity got the better of me, and I went to the door and opened it carefully, without saying a word. I instinctively took a step back. Kate entered the room, and I immediately realized I was in the garage. You must have been in the garage, she remarked, closing the door behind her. I tried knocking, but you didn't hear me. I was just tidying up, I responded, observing the room's condition. Kate sighed and said, well, mom already called me. It looks like you've already made up your mind about what to do with me. Kate looked at me, her face a mix of sadness and disappointment. What did you expect? That I wouldn't mind you having an affair? I asked her. She paused before responding, I guess I wasn't thinking clearly, at least not. Rationally. I was overwhelmed by disappointment. It's a shame because all I did was think, I confessed. You see, there was no one around to distract me from my thoughts. I missed having someone to go out to dinner with, visit a club, and enjoy the darkness whispering and kissing. But I was left with a woman who could deceive me without hesitation, even looking me straight in the eye. She could share my house, my food, my life, and then be close with someone else. Not a pleasant image, right? Are you really ready to let go of eleven years of our life together? What is it? she asked. Did you even bother to ask me about it, Dan? Would it have bothered you if I had a real relationship with someone else instead of just playing games? I thought that such an important question would stay with me, but it doesn't seem to matter anymore, does it? Now you and the person whose name I can't even remember can move on freely without caring about me, no more struggles over deciding whom to spend our anniversary with, I said, heading for a chair. I think I understand your perspective, Kate replied. Do you truly understand, Kate? Because I genuinely doubt that you do. 
You see, for you, it was just an act of infidelity. You probably found a way to justify it, maybe even shifting the blame onto me. Could it have been, Kate, perhaps my actions drove you to be involved with someone else? I inquired. She lowered her head and replied, No, I don't blame you for this. It just happened. Having an affair with someone other than a spouse for two months isn't an accident. It takes effort, and moreover, secrecy. To continue the affair requires additional effort. And let me tell you, honey, you're playing the role well. I fell in love, completely and unconditionally. It's unbelievable that you both managed to find time for your game. I can't even imagine how it feels to laugh about cheating on me, and that tearful phone call last night, it was a real performance. Maybe you should consider a new career. Your performance could easily outshine the last three Oscar winners. I must admit, I had a brief moment of uncontrollable laughter, just a quick unintended outburst before I stopped it. I don't know where it came from, but it's clear that you don't love me. If that's how you treat someone you love, please spare me your anger. How can you believe that I don't love you after eleven years, she protested indignantly. Listen, Kate, since you seem to enjoy asking questions, here's one for you. Given your deep introspection, you know how you usually react to various situations. Based on this, imagine that I found out you had an intimate relationship with another man, but it was a one-time occurrence, not a long-term affair. How do you think I would react? I asked. She leaned toward me and replied in a soft tone, To be honest, I think I would have asked you to leave our house and start divorce proceedings. I thanked her for her honesty and admitted that I had expected such a reaction, even imagining that she might throw something at me. But who knows? I mused aloud. She responded with a faint smile, perhaps. And now, imagine that for nearly three months, every day we spent together meant nothing to me. It was all just an act, a facade to deceive you into thinking our relationship was thriving. In reality, I was going through the motions while my heart belonged to someone else, spending entire days with my mistress after leaving you. Can you honestly believe that I love you after nearly thirteen years? Show me some confidence, Kate, I said seriously. It's as if you're implying that you don't care about this situation. The time we spent together was very valuable to me. It wasn't just casual conversation. I genuinely enjoyed being with you, she said. Do you recall the last time we were close, Kate? When was the last time you initiated one of our affectionate kisses? When did you last act like my wife, Kate? After what I've witnessed and heard, I find it hard to believe you're standing here, telling me you love me. I'm not naive. I overheard you discussing him with that gossip, March, as soon as he arrived at the office. And then, to top it off, you both came up with the idea of giving her a gift for bringing you two together. It seems like you've already found your next bridesmaid. All that's left is to find his best man, and the wedding banquet will be ready, I commented, reclining in my chair. So, it turns out you're just like me after all. Should I expect a server to show up at my doorstep? Kate inquired. What is it? She asked. First and foremost, I need to know where you're going to live. You won't find a process server waiting on your doorstep to deliver the divorce papers. I've reserved that privilege for myself. That's it, the case is closed. Escape from Kate and move forward. If you happen to see me with someone else, please don't try to intervene, I stated. What are you trying to prove with this? Kate asked. I probably didn't think I needed to prove anything to you. What I did, I did for myself, not for you. Why would I fight for a man like you? Those who respected me so little thought that I would tolerate or make excuses for the way you treated me. When I gave you the ring, it was a clear sign that you were done. I don't want to invest my energy in something that no longer matters to either of us. I can't forget or forgive. And based on your past and present behavior, it's evident that I'm not a priority for you. So, it's time for me to leave you, Kate, and move on. I don't pretend to understand how you expected everything to end, but you certainly ruined everything. Now it's your turn to sleep at his place, I said, locking eyes with her. You're kicking me out and keeping everything for yourself. To be honest, it seems unfair after eleven years, she replied. It always comes down to a deal, doesn't it? Well, that's settled. If you need a house, you'll have to pay for it. As for me, I want to keep the house. I've fallen in love with him. With the extra space, I can finally transform it into what I truly desire. I assumed you and Bast had already found a place, I said. His name is Paul, she corrected. 
I couldn't care less about that, really. Do you think he has nowhere to live? I asked. Well, of course he does, she responded. In that case, problem solved, I remarked. I was waiting for your answer. And then it occurred to me. So, I guess you don't think his wife will agree to this arrangement, I said, noticing her expression. Wait, did you find out everything about him? How did you know he was married, she asked. Seriously, this isn't a joke. You really think I'm naive, don't you? Why else would you be here, Kate? So, what's the deal? He doesn't want to divorce his wife for you? I hope you haven't seriously considered coming back to me. I've contemplated this particular question. I consider the possibility that our relationship had lasted 11 years. However, upon reflection, I concluded that we're done. This decision was made by you. Let's reminisce about those incredible two months you spent together and hope for even more in the future. Keep in mind, as I mentioned before, when I gave you the ring, it signified the end. Please refrain from making excuses about our 11-year history. Those years didn't matter to you in the past and don't matter to me now. Therefore, I'll compensate for those 11 years with a set of legal documents as soon as they're prepared. The house offer remains unchanged. If you don't want to leave the house, you can come back and take whatever you want. It appears you're ready to move on without any hesitation, divorce me, and go on your way. You may be trying to elicit my sympathy, but I want to make it clear that I'm moving on from someone I can't trust living under the same roof with me. I will never trust you again, so what's your plan? Do you want to keep the house for yourself? I asked. No, I have no desire to keep this house. Give me a few days to find a new place, and I'll likely take a significant portion of the furniture, she replied, taking her hand out of her pocket. What should I do with this, she asked, handing me the ring. Do whatever you want with it. Oh, I have an idea. Why not use it as a toe ring? It would fit perfectly on your big toe, given how you treated him. I might actually find some use for it, I suggested. Okay, you know what? I could use some extra money. Maybe I'll pawn it, she warned. Well, you won't get much for it. They buy these things by weight, and most likely you won't even get $130. You can't buy a genuine gold ring for your finger for $130, but that's just my opinion. It's your ring, so do as you please with it, I stated, turning towards the door. Did you get all my stuff out of the closet? she asked. Yes, I got everything, though I was a bit annoyed with the furniture at the time. I'll call you in a few days. I have to admit I didn't pack your things very neatly. I hope you still have clean, unwrinkled clothes after the trip, I commented. May I take a look, she inquired. Of course, don't be shy. You know where everything is, I said, noticing a slight frown on her face. I waited patiently as she inspected the room. I could hear her rummaging in the bedroom, then in the closet, and finally in the bathroom. A few minutes later, she returned downstairs hastily packing cosmetics into a floral zip-up bag. You were thorough. You only missed a few things. I may have to call you when it's time to move, she said with a forced smile. Of course, I'd be happy to help, as long as it's not too close to me, I replied, smiling affably, getting up to open the door for her. When she suggested going for a walk, I paused for a moment considering her request, and then an idea struck me. Wouldn't it be too much to ask you to run around instead? I inquired, maintaining a serious expression. Kiss me on the spot, she replied, turning to leave. I wouldn't dare kiss someone who knows where she's been, I retorted, closing the door behind her. That marked the end of our communication. Three months later, my lawyer diligently filed all the necessary divorce documents, instructing me to pick them up from his office on Monday. My itinerary for the day included two stops, first at the lawyer's office and then at my mother-in-law's house. The sole objective was to obtain Kate's signature on the documents, ensuring she had no false hopes of reconciliation. After parking my car at her house, I paused for a moment, gazing at the familiar facade, contemplating the completion of this final task. It might take some time, but eventually, I would find solace in quiet nights again as this chapter would finally be closed. Exiting the car, I made my way to the front door and rang the doorbell. To my surprise, my mother-in-law answered. Well, Dan, what brings you here? What's going on? she asked. I thought you had forgotten about us already, I replied. Not yet, is Kate here? I inquired. Yes, she's here. Come on in, she replied, 
closing the door behind her. A few moments later, Kate entered the room. Kate, I'm here for you to sign these papers. I'll file them tomorrow, and then our divorce will be finalized. I just want it to be over, I explained. Kate sighed and said, I don't think I've ever been good enough for you, have I? Do you seriously think I'll just stand by and watch your actions over the past few months? Kate briefly left the room but soon returned with a pen in her hand. As she hastily signed her name on the appropriate pages, I watched her movements carefully. When she finished, she forcefully placed the pen on the table and swiftly gathered everything into a manila envelope, ready for archiving. Free now, she said. Thank you for signing these. Take care of yourself and find happiness. Shifting her focus from me to herself, she added, Mom, you can come into the room. Congratulations to you as well, I replied before walking out the door. As I drove away, a wave of mixed emotions washed over me. I understood that this marked the end of our relationship, and I couldn't shake the feeling that life was about to take a new turn. Just a month later, our divorce was finalized, signaling the start of a completely different life. In due course, I received unexpected news from Kate's father. He informed me that after our divorce, Kate had asked Paul to leave his wife and marry her. However, Paul made it clear to Kate that he couldn't do that. He admitted that their relationship had no romantic feelings for her. After realizing the truth, Kate had to accept the reality of moving forward without me and Paul. Drawing from the experiences of our past, she now lives with her parents while seeking new job opportunities after a humiliating dismissal from her previous position. Her father attributes her situation to my influence, echoing Paul's circumstances. Kate's discontent is palpable, her interactions have been with either married individuals seeking brief encounters or men of dubious character. Her indiscriminate involvement in intimate relationships has resulted in a psychiatric disorder, for which she is now undergoing therapy.